Last time on Glitch in Depth, we talked about what I said might be the most famous glitch in gaming, the Mew glitch, and I may actually have been wrong in saying that. Sure, it may be the most famous glitch of all of the Pokemon franchise, but no glitch is as much of a household name as the infamous Minus World glitch in the original Super Mario Bros. Because this glitch is so famous, basically everyone has at least a basic grasp of what happens. You access the warp zone before you're supposed to, so the game doesn't load the right warp zone and you end up going to a glitch world. But this isn't the full story of what happens and why this glitch works. Some sources will tell you that it happens because there was no number on the screen currently assigned to the warp zone pipe at the time you used it. This actually isn't true, and no one with any technical knowledge of what's actually going on would believe it. After this video, you will have the knowledge you need to prove them wrong. Today, on Glitch in Depth, we're going to cover the full story as we explore the mysteries of the Minus World glitch. To understand why we get to the Minus World, we first need to understand how warp zones work. There are three warp zones in the game, one at the end of 1-2 that takes you to world 2, 3, or 4, one at the end of 4-2 that takes you to world 5, and one that you can get to by climbing the vine in 4-2 that takes you to world 6, 7, or 8. Let's take a look at how the game knows what worlds these warp pipes need to go to. Warp zone numbers are contained starting at offset 87F2 of the program ROM, and here's what the data look like. The first four bytes correspond to the 1-2 warp zone. The second four correspond to the underground 4-2 warp zone, and the last four correspond to the above-ground 4-2 warp zone. We can actually prove this with hacking. Here I used the hex editor to change the value 4 to 8, and just look at what ends up happening. With hex editing, we can actually access glitch worlds other than the minus world. Anyway, the odd one out of this bunch is the underground 4-2 warp zone, whose data read 24524. This corresponds to a warp to world hex 24, or world 36, on the left pipe, a warp to world 5 on the middle pipe, and another warp to world 36 on the rightmost pipe. But since the warp zone only has the middle pipe, we can't warp to world 36. So what's with the warps to world 36 on either side? Well. Hex value 24 corresponds to a blank space in the Super Mario Bros. font. We need this blank space because the values at 87F2 in memory determine not only what worlds the warp pipe takes us to, but also the numbers to draw over each pipe in the warp zone. The warp zone object is programmed to always draw three tiles since most of the warp zones have three pipes, but since this warp zone only has one pipe in the middle, the game draws blank spaces to the left and right. We can show with hacking that changing one of these values draws a number that we don't need, so it makes sense that we're using blank spaces. And these warps technically still work, we just normally can't use them because there's no pipe that would let us. I hacked an extra warp pipe into this warp zone to show you what happens when you try to go into a warp pipe assigned to world 36. Just like how a warp zone pipe with a 4 over it takes us to 4-1, and like how a pipe with a 5 over it takes us to 5-1, a warp pipe with the blank tile over it takes us to blank 1, or the minus world. Since the blank space is decimal value 36 in Super Mario Bros.'s font, we're actually going to world 36-1, but since the game draws tile 36 as a blank, it looks like we're going to world blank 1. Indeed, it's this warp number 36 that takes us to the minus world. But wait, that's in 4-2's warp zone. How do we get to that from world 1-2? Well, all of the warp zones are actually the same object, and the game determines which warp zone to load depending on the value at offset 06d6. By default, this value is 0, which doesn't correspond to any warp zone, but that's okay because most of the time we aren't anywhere near a warp zone. However, near the end of 1-2 we spawn a scroll lock object. This scroll lock object executes code when it spawns, and that includes incrementing the value at 06d6 to make warp pipes for the warp zone. Now, normally we access the warp zone by running across the top of the screen, which parses another scroll lock object, but this scroll lock object is special in that it also loads the correct values for the warp zone. Here's how it works. First, the game loads the value 4 into 06d6, which signifies the first warp zone to be used. Then it checks the world number the player is at. If the player is on world 1, it uses 04 and stores it in the warp zone variable 06d6 and branches off past all this code. If not, the game loads the value 5. Then the game checks to see what type of level the player is on. If the player is on an underground, water, or castle type level, it stores 5 into 06d6. If we're on 1-2, this doesn't execute and the value stays at 4 because we already jumped to a different instruction. Anyway, then the game checks to see if Mario is on a normal, above ground level. If he is, it stores the value 6 into 06d6. As a result, the value will be 4 if we're in the 1-2 warp zone, 5 if we're in the underground 4-2 warp zone, and 6 if we're in the 4-2 above ground warp zone. 
There's a place in the game's code that tells the game to print out the text Welcome to Warp Zone if the value of 066 is 4, 5, or 6, which will always be true when we spawn a warp zone in normal play. So when we parse the warp zone object, we also end up telling the game to draw the warp zone text. After this subroutine prints the warp zone text, it determines which warp zone it needs to load by subtracting 4 from the value at 066. So if our starting value is 4, we get 0, if it was 5, we get 1, and if it was 6, we get 2. But since we never parse this special scroll lock object when we walk through the wall, the value of 066 is still 1 from when the first scroll lock object incremented it. This value of 1 corresponds to the 4-2 underground warp zone, so the game thinks we're in that warp zone instead of the 1-2 warp zone. We can verify this by entering the middle pipe, which takes us to world 5. When we enter the left or right pipe, however, we go to world 36, or the minus world. So that explains why we get to the minus world, but now let's tackle a question about the minus world itself. Why is it an infinitely looping copy of world 7-2? First, let's look at why the minus world is a lot like 7-2. When we go into a pipe, the game runs an algorithm to determine what room to put Mario in. If the value at 06d6 is 0, which is most of the time, the game skips this code and sends Mario to wherever the area offset variable 0750 is set to. This means that if we go into a warp zone pipe in 1-2 and the value of 06d6 is 0, which is only possible via hacking, we actually end up at wherever the offset sends us, which is value hex 25, which corresponds to the staircase at the end of the level. It's as if we entered the regular L-shaped pipe. But if this value isn't 0, and it isn't in the case of the minus world because the scroll lock incremented the value to 1, the game uses the world number to find the appropriate area offset in a lookup table to determine what level data to load. When the value hex 24 is used as the world number, the warp zone code that determines where we go uses the number hex 24 as the warp offset and gets the number hex 33, which tells it to look exactly hex 33, or decimal 51, bytes past the start of the area address offsets, which happens to have the byte value 1, which corresponds to world 72. This lookup table is actually only 36 bytes long since that's all the game ever needs normally, so 51 bytes past the starting byte is actually outside the area offset lookup table, which puts it in the enemy data address table. We actually get this level data from data that the lookup table isn't supposed to access, and this is how other glitch worlds work too. Anyway, the game loads what it thinks is world 36-1, but it behaves more like world 7-2. Now let's look into why the level loops. It's all because of the area change object in the enemy data. Let's look at how it works. The area change object data are three bytes long. The first byte is the location byte, telling the game where the object is. The second byte is the area address offset, which tells the game which room to send the player to if he goes down a pipe or climbs a vine. The third byte is divided into two parts. The important part is the first three bits, the world number. If the current world number is not equal to the world number in the object, the area address offset doesn't update. Keep this in mind. We load a clone of 72, which contains a change area object that sets the area address offset to hex 25 if we're in world 7. When we're actually in 72, the area offset is set to hex 25 because the current world number matches the world number in the object. However, the minus world, which reads the data from 72, is not in world 7, so the game does not load the area offset hex 25 into the area offset variable, which would let us leave the level. Instead, it still contains the value hex 1 from when it was set in 1 2. Because the offset never changes, the pipe that would normally lead out to the surface loads 1 again, so we go back to the beginning of the level. Thus, the minus world loops endlessly. And with that, the mysteries of the minus world glitch have been solved. Now we know why the minus world is how it is, and why we can get to it in the first place. I hope you all learned something today. I'll see you guys next time on the next episode of Glitch in Depth. Until then, happy glitching.